And out of desperation, I had a friend that said there was this crazy movement called the carnivore. I heard of it and I didn't do anything about it, but there was this really dark cycle that I went through again of the whole binge purge cycle. And I was desperate that not one single medical doctor or practitioner or dietitian told me. Hello, welcome everyone. Carrie here from Homestead How in the Carnivore Diet Documentary. I'm honored to have Judy with us today from Nutrition with Judy. Welcome, Judy. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. Likewise. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I've been looking forward to talking to you. Would you mind maybe starting out by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you found carnivore? Yeah, so I was plant based for over a decade. And I started struggling with mental health issues and an eating disorder. I thought it was that I was just sort of wired that way that maybe work life balance was difficult. And that just got me sick. Um, I even went to therapy for my eating disorder. And never once did they say that my diet of being plant based could ever be part of the issue. And in fact, that I was healthy for eating that way. And I then had a breakdown with my first son as six months in, I was still plant based still using eating disorder behaviors, trying to nurse around the clock being type a, and I got on antibiotics. And then I just didn't have a memory of for a week or two after that. And our family didn't know what to do. They sent me to eventually we have a psychiatrist in the family, they sent me to the psych ward, they gave me medications. And then it just started this journey. No one could ever tell me what happened. They said, maybe she's suffering from um, postpartum depression. It's not as common when it's six months out, but it typically happens right away. But so they said, maybe she needs a little bit of eating disorder therapy. So I went into this really intensive care. And again, there they put me on different types of psychiatric medications. And never once was it the diet. Um, they said, you can't remove carbs, because that's an eating disorder. But if you want to eat plant based, that's totally a respectable diet. And I was working with dietitians. And my brother was doing a ketogenic diet, and I was out to prove that he was wrong. And in my research, and I'm still going through my journey of figuring out what was wrong with me, I find all this data about how fat is good for you, and how protein is really nutrient dense. So I decided to eat a ketogenic version of a plant based diet, and it helped some but it still did not get rid of all my behaviors and a lot of the imbalances I had. And out of desperation, I saw I had a friend that said there was this crazy movement called the carnivore, where people were just eating meat online. And I thought that was nuts. And so I heard of it, and I didn't do anything about it. But there was this really dark cycle that I went through again of the whole binge purge cycle. And I was desperate. And I thought, okay, there are people that have these magical stories, let me just try it. And my life changed. So I think I am one of the more miracle stories where I ate that way. And then all of a sudden, within six months, no more mental health issues, no more depression, I'm not on any medications, I'm not on any hormone replacements, and I'm in my early 40s. And I was so shocked to realize that it wasn't that I was broken that whole time that my psychiatrist saying that I needed to take antidepressants my whole life, and maybe sometimes add antipsychotics, that maybe that I had that breakdown and loss of being able to nurse my son because of the class C drugs, that all of that could have been because of my diet that not one single medical doctor or practitioner or dietitian told me that may, was wild to me. And so as I did more research, and I got more passionate about it, I changed my career. And then I got into the nutrition space, because I honestly just wanted to share that was my whole reason. And then it just became this thing that I never imagined it to be. Wow. Your, your story is incredible. It's, it's really incredible to me because mine is very similar. I had horrible clinical depression and I went on keto and it seemed to help me slightly. I'm like, whoa, there's something, finally something. I, I, for like eight years, I was on every SSRI and antidepressant okay. medicine and they did nothing. But I did keto and I started feeling a little bit better, but it didn't it didn't do anything like carnivore. It's it's kind of remarkable. Your story It sounds very, very similar to mine. Um, so in terms of the depression, that's one 
frankly, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about carnivore as well. Um, you kind of used the word there earlier. It's you're, you're, you're at a point where you're desperate or hopeless. It seems like there's a lot of other people out there now in your work in the meantime, since you started doing carnivore, what have you seen with depression and mental health? Is it is it that just you and I are kind of an unusual case or are, are a lot of people or everyone that seems to do carnivore um, notice significant improvements with their depression? I think most people do see some level of benefit. I do think we, it, it really depends on the, what subset of the population of carnivore you're talking about. So in our practice, we work with, with the people that carnivore doesn't work enough, where they need a lot more fine tuning. Maybe they need a little bit of supplements for whatever reason, maybe the meat is not being absorbed as much in the body. So for our subsection of carnivores, they heal a lot, but they may need still some more support in terms of mental health. And so there, we can discuss that. But I think generally speaking, meat itself, will, especially if you remove all the noise of the plants, you'll hear, heal your gut because you have less invaders of attacking your immune system, busying up your immune system, causing holes in your cell wall lining. And so as your gut heals, and then you give the proper raw materials to even make, if it's a SSRI, if it's a um, not enough serotonin, which I don't think that's one of the main reasons for uh, depression. But if it was, you're giving all the raw materials to produce serotonin. So serotonin is created by B vitamins, vitamin D. Um, you need certain amino acids to help produce and convert tryptophan, which is an amino acid to serotonin, for example, and then even help with melatonin. So all of those things, when you're eating animal based will support the neurotransmitters for good mental health. And then as you're not eating the foods that causes leaky gut, you know, leaky gut causes leaky brain, there's that whole brain gut balance. So as you're just eating the foods that we are meant to eat, and they're nutrient dense, you're absorbing them better because they're in the bioavailable form or the form that your body can use as nutrients, then you're supporting your brain to be healthier and not struggle with as much depression. So I think that's one you're giving that raw materials. And then as you again, heal your gut, you, there's just more of that neurotransmitter that's able to get through to the blood brain barrier and support that. I was plant based for 12 years. So I didn't know. Well, one, I didn't even know that I needed a supplement vitamin D B12. But I was also eating a low fat version of um, a plant based diet. So I was scared of eating anything that had anything to do with fat. And you need fat, you're your brain is 60% fat, it uses most of the fat than any other part of your body in terms of the percentage. So when you are starving your body of good fats, I mean, no wonder your brain starts having imbalances. And then lastly, a lot of the newer research for mental health is that it's actually inflammation. So when you think of everything in our body and illness, it's all systemic, chronic, low dose inflammation, unless you have an active infection, which will obviously cause infection but, or inflammation, but when you have, you're constantly eating uh, pizzas and bagels and lots of un ultra high processed foods that were not intended to eat, and then additionally not eating the nutrient dense meats, our bodies don't have the ability then to give those raw materials to our brain and it's inflamed. So that's where I think we start feeling that inflammation and then the depression that comes with it. And then additionally, when you're tired and exhausted from eating bad foods, you aren't as active and you're not doing the things in life that you want to do, which then exacerbate that depression, I think. Right. Yeah, it just it starts to snowball. I think you kind of answered my next question. But one thing I've been hearing a lot from people, um, I'm down 100 pounds since my heaviest. Oh, wow. And so but it's been the mental health and the depression, the anxiety, the arthritis that I've overcome that's really been life changing for me. But people keep saying to me, Carrie, you would have done that same thing if you just got rid of the sugar and the junk food. Um, I think that has something to do with it, but I, how do you feel? Because they're and then they say you could have just done the same thing eating plants or vegan. Totally. Um, well, so that's where I think um, I feel fortunate that I had the chance of being plant based. I mean, I used to support PETA. I mean, that's how plant based I was, and I wouldn't even use leather. Like I, it was that extreme of a. I'm plant based. And then it, it wasn't even that I chose to be plant based because of an ethical reason. I did it because 
I heard that was healthy. I'm from California. And then I went to Berkeley. So, I mean, you can't get more plant-based than that. Right. <laughs> and I lived off of large bowl salads, but my health started going down and I just never understood why. And never once what, did anyone ever say it could be related to your diet. And it's true that if you remove all ultra processed foods, that you will feel better. So on a plant based diet, because you're removing a lot of the toxic seed oils, well, I don't know if they really remove it in plant based diets. But if you remove a lot of that ultra processed foods, you will start feeling better. If you remove sugars, you will start feeling better. But it's the longevity part. That's the question. Mm. In 12 years, for me, I mean, just a few years in, I started having these mental health imbalances. And then I would have these urges to go binge. And I realize now it's because my body was like, I need her to go eat fat or something that will give other nutrients. And so I'm going to have her have this really, really strong craving to go out and binge because she needs it for her nourishment. And I think I like to use a very logical hat with the way that I think. And if it was truly that all we needed was to just clean up our diet. I think the paleo diet or the keto diet, and no one would ever need to find a carnivore diet if it was truly that we just needed to remove certain foods because there are so many elimination diets. Paleo is a pretty clean diet. They remove all sugars. Maybe they leave in some fruits. They, re they remove most grains. They remove a lot of things and they try to eat ancestral, but there's so many people that don't heal from paleo that then they move to keto and then some of them move to carnivore. So I just think there's this fundamental elimination diet component of carnivore where you are for every bite, that bite counts so much because every bite is nutrient dense, and you're removing the assault that will be caused to your immune system. And that will just support your you to start really healing the body. Mm, right. Yeah. When people say that to me, too, I'm just like, I don't know too, because when I eat a big fatty ribeye, I just, I feel amazing. It's like my body after 43 years is like, you finally figured it out after all these years. Like that's kind of what I was looking for. Um, so there's, you, yeah. can I, can I just say, so in fatty meat, um, there's a, there's an enzyme it's called anandamide. I think it's kind of like, um, a relaxant. It's like THC almost. I forgot what the other, um, ingredient, but it's a, it's a, it has a literally has a relaxing calming effect. So I really? think that's why it might be why carnivores tend to seem chill or calm. I wonder if it's that enzyme that we're consuming a lot. Um, I'll put it in my next version of the book, but and I'll, I'll email it to you to give you that nuance, but it, it could be that. So that feeling you feel of satiety and nutrient density, but I think it also might be that anandamide that you are feeling or getting that makes you feel that calming, like this is good. That's really cool. I haven't yeah. heard of that before. And it's funny because I did a short a couple months ago saying like, I get a steak high after I eat because I just <laughs> totally feel amazing true. afterwards. <laughs> so there's some science behind it. That's cool. Uh, so how long, Judy, have you been doing carnivore now? So it's been over six years. Um, I'm not strict, strict carnivore anymore. And I openly talk about it because I don't want people to think that everyone is perfect carnivore. Um, so I was really strict, meaning like not even seasonings, nothing else other than not not a, nothing sugar free um, for a good three years. And then I just started to think about, well, I struggled from an eating disorder. And could I possibly bring in anything else just to see if I'm healing. And so that's where I started dabbling in. Can I try to eat a veggie or can I eat like a sugar free something and will it trigger me? And it wasn't super easy. But over the years, I feel like I can really eat anything if I really wanted to but I don't because I still see effects like I'll if I ever ate bread, um, I feel like I get a response to it, right? Like I just don't feel well. So I think from a mental health perspective, I totally feel like I could eat anything at this point. But this is six years, six, seven, almost seven years in. And then that was also a year of keto as well. So I've done that healing and now I don't have to be perfect, super strict carnivore, but I'd say I eat like 95% carnivore. Um, and then on some days it's just all carnivore. So it's all meats of all the varieties, but some days, like, let's say we go out to eat and if there's seasonings, I don't worry about that too much. Um, but if my kids are, let's say eating some veggies, I might have a bite, but it's not 
so common, but I, I think the big thing I have is that I have that food freedom now where mm. I'm not scared. I don't get triggered when I go to a party where I'm like, I want to eat that cupcake, but I can't. So that I think is the blessing of being six ish years meat based. Right. You, you sound um, pretty fired up and passionate about, um, well, I guess more so upset about none of these doctors ever mentioned nutrition for you for so many of the issues you had. Do you see that changing in the future at all? I, I just, I got to show you this real quick. Sorry. I always show people this, but these were, I was a mess before carnivore. Those were all my pills for the last 10 years. And I, I said the same thing that you, you said like twice now is none of those doctors said anything about nutrition. And it turns out every single one of those were nutrition related. Do you like see this changing at all? It just seems so crazy to me that you go to the doctor and they don't ask you what you're eating. I mean, honestly, that's our plan. Our, our company's plan is to change that. So we want to release carnivore studies that show that inflammation actually does go down. And we have certain markers we can share that if people test for that, we have seen that it is lower on people that are eating carnivore versus somebody that's eating the standard American diet. And some of those markers are used for like rheumatoid arthritis. And so if we can prove that, then you, the science is out there, right? So I don't know when it would get adopted by mainstream. It's always that question of, is it in their financial interest to do that for us, right? So I remember asking my psychiatrist, does diet have anything to do with my mental illness, like, can it improve? And he looks up from him writing the, the prescription. And he said, not really. And then he look, went back down and I said, okay. And I just, I trusted that. Mm -hmm. And now looking back, I know that so much of it is not true. And I just think, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a, a, a financial benefit or if it's because these doctors are so busy or just what they've learned. But I think we should always try to challenge status quo. So our practice, because of the sheer number of people we work with and then do testing, um, our goal is to get out papers to at least challenge in the functional space. And then maybe it'll be adopted enough because there's enough research on it so that maybe it'll get adopted by insurance, right? And that's where it could get standard care. But I'm just, standard care is so based on, I have a symptom, here's the band-aid, right? And it's, here's the quick picks, a fix, here's the quick pill. So I don't know how quickly that'll change, but I do believe we can change. We have those stories of Coke being in Coca-Cola and then how all the mothers marched to get it out of the Coca-Cola product. And it was how we used to have DDT in our lawn care and now it's not in there. So I do believe it's a hard fight and battle, but I do think if enough people like you and myself can share about this and then show data and show our stories and people adopt and try, and then they share, it's that big effect of there will be a tipping point where we can have people heal. Yeah. I look forward to that day. That's kind of one of my goals too, especially for this next generation of children that they don't know what it's like to be like a natural human brought up on sugar and become lifelong sugar consumers from a young age and inflammation. And then they run into ADHD and all sorts of uh, issues going forward and end up on the antidepressant medicines and everything. So hopefully that'll change. So I, I've been talking to so many people. Uh, I did my 30 day update video and it kind of took off. And then um, we decided to do this carnivore diet documentary. So talk to a lot of people uh, that are starting carnivore or are new to it. And it seems like for some people, I'm so blessed and fortunate. I think, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems like men have it a little easier doing carnivore. I, for me, it seemed very easy. I had done keto on and off throughout the years, but I'm hearing from a lot of people that really struggle. Um, I think a big part of it is also uh, psychology and, you know, what's going on in their, in their minds. But what, what are some of the things you're doing um, at Nutrition with Judy that can help people like that? With the struggle of staying carnivore or? Yeah, or starting or they, they want to start, but they don't know how. I know they always say you have to have your why. I think there's a lot of people out there that are kind of desperate with their why, but the how, like, like kind of like you said, this is so crazy. I don't know what to do. Or they, they just run into issues doing it. I, I've had a couple people email me recently that like I've been doing carnivore for 60 days. I'm not losing any weight. I'm not having these amazing results that you're having, Carrie. What am I doing wrong? And I, I don't know what to tell folks like that. Sure. 
From a weight loss perspective, it depends. So if they're just in that, you know, the 20 pounds remaining that you want to lose those that is much harder, especially if you've been dieting your whole life and, and then you have hormonal imbalances, so that can impact it. If you are 100 pounds overweight, you should lose weight within the first 90 ish days, especially if you were insulin resistant, you had blood sugar imbalances, and you're eating, you're sticking just to whole meats. Um, I believe that when you first start to make it sticky, as in that you'll stay on the diet, you have to eat what you like, not just what any influencer tells you to eat. But if you like chicken and pork and beef, I would start with all of that and see if you're not sensitive to certain foods, because you know, there's people in the carnivore space that are super sensitive, they have to eat only ruminant meats. But if you're not one of those people, and it's just a, I want to heal my metabolic syndrome, then eat all the kinds of meats you want. But maybe you eat only three meals a day and not try to snack all day long. So that's one way that you can support your insulin to go down. And once your insulin goes down, and your blood sugar is more regulated, you can actually lose weight. Um, I would then as you get more into a fat burning state and not a sugar burning, then I would try to fine tune. So if it's been 30 days, and you haven't lost a single pound, I would start tracking things. So maybe do a food and mood journal, write down in your um, like in a my fitness pal or chronometer, see how much you're eating. Are you getting sufficient protein? Are you eating enough fat? And for a lot of people, they don't end up eating enough fat and they eat more protein and they may never feel satiated. So then they snack longer, which will then cause a, a smaller, but more often insulin response. And so I would then try to go higher fat, but there's so many different things that you can do. Like you can try to do two meals a day. You can try to go higher fat. You can um, eat, eat just ruminant for a while. So there's little hacks that you can do. And I think a lot of the carnivore space now talks about them. And that's how you can see from a weight loss perspective. But I really think to make the diet sticky, you have to enjoy what you're eating. So like you, however long you've been into it, the fact that you can eat a ribeye and you feel that bliss, that's what I need people to do when they're eating. So when people are begrudgingly eating liver, or they're like, I know that this grass finished steak is the best for me, but it tastes like grass. They're not enjoying what they're eating. And then there's no way you're going to do that long term, right? So like, I, I know I need to have this schedule and do this and eat this time and take this supplement and do that. It's not going to work. You have to do what you enjoy because part of people wait for their meal time. And so it, I would suggest starting with the meats you enjoy and don't worry about nuance of is it grass finished? Or is it? Um, is this the cleanest meat? Is there any little added something just get off the carbs. And then from there, you can fine tune. And then in, in terms of stalling on weight, you could just, again, use some of the levers I had brought up, I think fasting can be an option for some people. It's not always the best. But I think the fact that we work with some of the sickest, and so it's the most nuanced care, person one and person two is never the same. And knowing that there is no one answer that works for any one of these people. And if you know that all of the gurus, the influencers that share their n equals one may not work for you. And so you have to find what works for you and try things for at least a week. And then you can always pivot when it's not working. Right. Okay. Yeah. It seems like a big part of carnivore is kind of taking your health into your own two hands and doing yes. some research and testing things out and seeing what works. Uh, so you've, you've worked with a lot of people over the years. What are some, if you could share like some remarkable stories you've seen with people on carnivore turning health issues around? Um, one person I could think of is um, this person suffered from an autoimmune. So Hashimoto's uh, was overweight her whole life and then had uh, sensitivities to dairy. So couldn't eat any dairy. And then as she worked on her gut, and as she worked on eating just really strict, she was strict beef only for a very long time. And as she was healing, and one of the ways that we knew she was healing was she was sleeping better through the night. So I like to measure healing in five ways. So it's sleep, stool, mood, energy and hormones. And if those seem to be tracking the right way, even if it's a slight improvement, I think those are good signs. And so she was sleeping better, her moods were better. And we started challenging her to introduce other foods and she was able to, so other meats, not just um, other foods, but, and then over time we had her try to eat dairy and it, she could, it was the first time in her life ever. She used to get histamine responses and she was not anymore. And I think as you heal your gut, 
your immune system, because most of your immune systems in your gut, it's like 70 to 80%. So mm. as you heal your gut, your immune system should be able to handle a little bit more because there's just less noise. And so now eating dairy, and I maybe she can't eat dairy all the time. But if she could eat some dairy, she could do it without a histamine response, which I thought was huge. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah. I, um, I, I recently spoke to a guy, he, he has stage four cancer, oh. and he's going through chemo. Um, but he started doing carnivore and fasting. And he's, he's doing the best he possibly can given the circumstances. But it was really interesting. Some of the research, I think Professor Seafried has done on mm -hmm. cancer and things like that in terms of actually being able to reduce chemo uh, medications when you're in a state of ketosis and fasting. Uh, so this, this person, Jeff, has been doing it. He just hit his 28th round of chemo. So it's pretty remarkable wow. hearing, hearing his stories. That's kind of the thing with the carnivore diet documentary. We're just trying to share real examples from people with different health ailments like that over the course of the year to see, to see how they, um, what, what carnivore does for them over the course of the year. Yeah, Dr. Al Dannenberg, he passed away not too long ago, but he was a dentist was told that he basically had a few months to live. And then he went carnivore and lived an extra five years. So there's I mean, we have so many stories of people getting off medications of diabetic medications and insulin medications and being able to sleep through the night now or balancing their hormones and maybe getting off their thyroid medications or getting to the lowest dose of thyroid medication. So we have incredible stories, our bodies are a system that when something is wrong, it will show an illness, your body is telling you that something is imbalanced. And when we can fundamentally the the way that we fuel our body is food. And if we can at least start with food, and eliminate everything else that can be noise to the body. And as we start healing, maybe we need to also fix our environment, or maybe we need a little bit of gut supports. But beyond that, we're giving the right fuel. So then if you give it time, it should heal lots of things. And if your blood sugar is no longer imbalanced, you don't need that medication. And over time, you may not need the mental health stuff because you're fueling the body correctly and you're letting it breathe finally so that it's not your immune system doesn't have to be so busy. And I think when people have an imbalance, it's because something is wrong and it's tr trying to find that root cause issue. Right. So outside of... Um carnivore and eating meat and recovering that way. Are there other things that you would, you talk about or adopt um, to, to just improve your life in general once you start doing carnivore? It seems like for myself and others, we started just, oh, we're just eating meat and now we feel great. But then you start doing all these other things. Is there any anything else that you recommend outside of just uh, eating meat? Yeah, um, I, I believe in holistic health. So for me personally, once I started eating meat, I had more free time, right? You have more energy, you have the this energy to do things. And I wanted to give back. Um, I think for me, service is a big thing. And uh, I, I think my faith is a huge thing for me. And so I think balancing that mind body spirit is so huge. Meat is not going to fix everything in your life. If you're in a bad marriage, for example, and you're eating meat, sure, you feel great. But if you're coming to a home that's hostile, it's not going to work, right? So it's making sure like, what else can I do in my life to improve myself? So maybe doing like a needs and wants list would be really ideal. Like how, what do you think in your life will fulfill you? I think those are super important things. If you're chronically ill, obviously getting rid of the chronic illness is so key too. But I think people need to, like you said, in the very beginning is figuring out your why. So not just why do I want to eat this diet? But what do I want to get from life? Like, why do I want to live? And like, what am I living for? And I think those components, whatever they are, are super valuable for someone to enjoy their life, like you do homesteading, right? And I think that's a if I was not a city girl or a big city girl, I would love to learn that because it seems so nature oriented. And there's a level of peace being in nature. There's so many studies that if you're just in nature or seeing even a picture of a tree, it calms yourself compared to being in around urban buildings and settings. So there's all these things that can benefit us, but it's really finding what will benefit you. And I, I know there's not a simple answer to that, but if you just take some quiet time to figure out what really makes me happy? Like what made me happy when I was little? What what hobbies did I turn to? And maybe those things will make you fulfilled because I know for sure that eating just meat will help you to heal. But then what's next? 
right? So maybe you give back, maybe you share your story, maybe, maybe you do like an art studio, I don't know. So it's just figuring out what else will now bring you joy. Love that. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying about nature. That's kind of the big thing with homesteading for sure. That was kind of my carnivore epiphany too. It's mm -hmm. like, why am I feeling so good? I'm eating meat, my body's healing, but it's kind of a return to nature natural. And now I'm doing more things that are natural, like getting out and getting sunlight and exercising and fresh air and things I wasn't yeah. doing before. It seems like the departure from nature is what was really messing me up for so many years before carnivore. So uh, one of the questions I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about, uh, so well, I guess before we jump into it, but it is just testing in general. I am about to hit, well, I just hit uh, six months on carnivore okay. and I get this, I got a lot of new people that are starting carnivore. They're a couple months into it and it's always a big concern. I've had a couple people email me in a panic. I went and got my blood work done and my cholesterol numbers through the roof. And my doctor wants me to start me on a statin and things like that. What, what sort of advice do you have for people on, on testing? And should they wait a certain time too before they start? So I think in a perfect world, if financials weren't an issue, if insurance wasn't an issue, I would do a full panel right before doing the um, the carnivore diet so that you know like your baseline. And then from there, I would do it in about three months. It takes about three months for red blood cells to turn. That's not all cells, but I think a three months is a good, and it's a good amount of time to think, okay, I'm going to be super strict on a diet to see if I want to pivot or not. So if you were to do it right before and then three months after, that would be good. Um, there are markers that change on a carnivore diet and obviously cholesterol is one of them, but there are, we see ferritin sometimes go up, which is like this iron storage form. And so sometimes recommending to donate blood would be beneficial. But I just think that if you have a baseline, that would be helpful. And then understanding, I think once you get your blood work, let's say after carnivore and you see markers out of range and you will, you'll, if you're doing carnivore correctly, your LDL will likely go up. Your total cholesterol will likely go up. Your triglycerides will likely go down and your HDL will likely go up. But in the, when you get the results, you see like high and low and it's just, Oh my gosh, all my blood work is out of range all of a sudden. And I never had this before, maybe this diet. And then you have your doctor on top of that saying, you may need to get on a statin. Like, mm -hmm. what are you eating? And I just think instead of freaking out at that point, just be aware that there are changes and there's a lot of episodes or um, links on social media that you can see people walk through their blood work. Like I even have one on my five or six year blood work for carnivore. And you can then do that comparison to see contextually, is this something that I need to panic about? And I mean, we could talk about cholesterol really quickly. Our LDL does go up. That is the one that we call, quote unquote, the bad cholesterol. Um, but it, there is really no bad or good. HDL is like an antioxidant like cholesterol that then mops up the LDL. What we really want to focus on with LDL, which I didn't see on yours, but is um, it's the LDL particle size. So the small ones are the ones. Um, the very first time I heard it from Dave Feldman from Cholesterol Code was think of it as a big highway. And if you have all these small LDL particles, like think of it as small cars, the chance of accidents are way bigger than if you had just a few big rigs. So that's the big fluffy LDL particle, the big ones. And those are much more softer, buoyant, and they're less likely to break and cause issues. So from a cholesterol perspective, if you are worried about your LDL, you can get the particle, you have this paste um, separate tests for these particle size cholesterols. But generally speaking, if you want to just see a trend, we typically see total cholesterol be out of range, we see LDL be out of range. And then there's a Framingham study that happened that if your LDL goes up, as long as your HDL goes up in proportion, then it'll be okay. So it shows that there's not as much of a cardiovascular risk. So I typically see LDLs in our carnivore community anywhere from like 200 to even 600. And then the HDL, if you're in 85 and between like 60 to 85, I think that's great. I think that's the sweet spot for HDL. There isn't, there's nuance about HDL. If it's above 85, it actually can be, although that's considered the quote unquote good HDL or cholesterol it can mean that there's inflammation in the body. So you don't want HDL to be 110 because I see that too. And then triglycerides are the floating fat in your blood. 
And the triglycerides is the number that you see go down a lot. And that marker is actually more related to cardiovascular risk. In the standard care range, they see that in the 150 and below is good. In the carnivore community, we like to see it at 100 and below and your markers were beautiful. So in the context I just brought up to you, all of your markers fell within range. The triglycerides, um, anything below 100 is good. 70s, 80s is a sweet spot. When I see triglycerides go down to 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, I know that person's probably under eating or under eating fat. Okay. And so for the LDL particle size mm -hmm. test, is, is there, when I got my test done, I just, I went through this third party website where you could order them from. Is that mm -hmm. something we could do? Or do you have any suggestions on where people should get testing or there's certain things they should ask their doctor for, or just, do you have to just do some of this yourself? Cause your doctor's not going to, not going to want to help you. So you can ask for it. I, I would always, if you can get it covered through insurance, I would always try to go that route. So you can ask for an NMR panel. It's uh, N is in Nancy, M is in Mary, R is in Robert. So you can ask for the NMR panel. The reason why doctors are so hesitant about testing is if they put you on a test that then charges insurance and the insurance doesn't, they'll come back and say, why did you test this person? They don't seem like they need it. We're not going to cover it. And then the onus goes on the doctor. So that's where the doctors become super hesitant because they don't want to bear the burden of having to get the financials. But if you were to say something like heart disease runs in my family, I'm scared I'm going to fall into that, you know, then you can get the particle size and it should get covered. But I, I would think that those third parties would also have the NMR panel. You would just have to order it um, separately. Okay. But I think doing like a complete blood count um, a comprehensive metabolic panel. Those are the standard blood markers that you get when you do a typical physical. And then there's like the insulin. Um, so it's not just the blood sugar we care about. We also care about what your insulin's doing. Your insulin look good. Anything under two looks really good um, or anything under five actually. And then for C peptide is another marker that's like insulin. Anything under two is really good. And I, you didn't do the C peptide, but you did insulin and your insulin markers look good. So it looks like you are becoming more insulin sensitive so that your blood sugar is balanced. Your blood sugar looked really good. I think it was in the eighties. Um, and then doing an A1C is different than just the fasting glucose because A1C measures three months and that marker typically, so that that's another marker for carnivore. It will typically go up as a carnivore. You're eating more meat. Maybe your red blood cells are living longer and the average person that does the blood work, maybe their blood cells die within three months. And so then they try to capture how much glucose was in that red cell. And for carnivores, the A1C starts to go up by just a little bit. And that freaks people out of, oh my gosh, this diet's making my blood sugar go up. But how can it make your blood sugar go up when you're not eating sugar? So I think it's these logical things that people get worried about, but you are probably, I would, if that's happening where your blood glucose and your A1C is going up, I would consider a CGM or a continuous glucose monitor test your insulin. And if you're the CGM, those things that you put on your arm, if it's not really moving when you're eating, so the blood sugar is not really having these big highs and lows, then you're probably okay. Mm, okay. Hey, quick question on those CGMs. I got into a little trouble the other day because I was talking about one of those. I, I need to learn more about those. I understand there's a place for those where they have where they're very valuable for people. I have some family members that have type two diabetes and they have those on and they just, they're eating like birthday cake and drinking Pepsi. And then they look at it and they're like, Oh, I better be careful. My numbers way <laughs> off of the alarms going down. I saw that. I'm like, what kind of world are we living in where they have this device on there? And it's just, so for, I guess if you have type one diabetes, maybe those make more sense. Or if you're just trying to dial things in, but is, are there other good use cases for those things that you're aware of? Yeah, I, I'm not the biggest biohacker. So the where our practice uses it is if people are really scared. So it's trying to dispel that worry. And they're not me explaining the A1C, what I just explained to you is not enough, right? Like, okay, I get the science, but it's still concerning to me that my blood sugar is in the low 90s like that when I used to be 70s as a keto person milligrams per deciliter for fasting glucose. So then I say, okay, let's do your wear a CGM just to disprove that you don't have anything to worry. And if their blood sugar stays within like 20, 30 milligrams per deciliter, no matter how much meat they're eating. And in the, in the evenings, it's not, or when they're going to bed, it's also staying pretty consistent. It gives them, okay, so it's just a, I'm consistent with my blood sugar, meaning that every time it goes up, 
that means insulin needs to come to bring it down. So if it's not going up much, that means you're also not using insulin and it's insulin resistance that causes that constant chronic inflammation. So when people see that, then their psyche can re relax in terms of that fear. And then the other way we use it is some people will go carnivore and they are still waking up in the middle of the night. And then some people are super alert. So they're sleeping, they wake up, they feel like they have to go to the restroom and they come back and now they're wide awake and they're having this constant issue. And so we have them do use a CGM to see, are you having a cortisol response because you're becoming hypoglycemic. So your blood sugar drops too low and then cortisol comes to save the day. And so you have this burst of energy because cortisol is like a energy producer or feeler. And, and then now you're wide awake. So we'll see in the blood sugar, maybe the blood sugar goes all the way down to fifties and then cortisol comes in and you see the CGM jump up to like 140. Mm -hmm. And so that, that reason of the spike, and that's why they wake up and now they're alert. So then if we know that's a case, then we will try to work on that during the day. So we'll maybe we'll have like a fatty meal right before bed or like not a fatty meal, like a fatty snack so that maybe it could help balance their blood glucose. We know that that person was probably insulin resistant, so they will need more support. Maybe they need to go to two meals a day instead of three, right? So we try to use that. But beyond that, for biohacking, it's unless you're saying, I want to eat carbs and I'm going to figure out which ones work better on my system, then maybe you try to use that to biohack, like which one can I allow and which one I couldn't. But any response over time, if you're constantly so maybe the mango only makes it go up a little bit compared to eating an apple. But maybe both are not super ideal for you, especially if you suffered from type two diabetes. Right? Yeah, that was what was getting me. I have a close family member that has one and he's actually lost part of his foot to type two diabetes. Uh -huh. And it's so sad. And I'm like, it's got, gotten this far that you have to have this device implanted on you. And it's like, why don't you just stop sugar instead of trying to drink a Pepsi and then see what the how the numbers respond? It's just some of the stuff since I've been carnivore, having these carnivore epiphanies are like a lot of craziness going on in the world or where things just seem so backwards from what they should be. Yeah, that's uh, how that's how much of a hold these foods have on you. Yeah. And and then. And then we become so lethargic and tired and brain foggy. That's why we mm. believe everything that the news tells us because we're overly tired. And then when the doctor is like, here's a pill so you could fix it. So you don't have to change your diet easy and done. But the thing yeah. that the doctor doesn't tell you is that pill doesn't work long-term. So then you're going to need to take more of that pill. And then when that pill doesn't work, you're going to have to use like an injection and then you're going to have to lose your foot eventually. And those are the things that our doctors are wrong about not telling us. My mom was diabetic. She had asthma through diabetic complications and had that foot neuropathy, the swelling, edema, dermatitis. And her doctor was like, you're eating white rice. You have to switch to brown. I mean, that was the recommendations at the hospital. Mm. And she was on metformin and she didn't even know how to do balance it well because she had to test the glucose levels. And then she went carnivore and she has none of those issues. She's on zero medications. And for a doctor and for a hospital and for the pharmaceutical companies, she's not a benefit and she's 71. Mm -hmm. So you just got to think about that context. I'm so happy that story had a happy ending with your mom. Yeah. That's really cool. My mom's a carnivore too. And my stepdad oh. and two of my sisters. It's, it's crazy. We did that 24 hour live stream and um, we were so fortunate. Dr. Barry jumped on, but I just like you, Judy, I was like, this carnivore thing is insane. There's no way. And then I watched a bunch of Dr. Barry videos. I'm like, this guy isn't that insane. So I'm going to try it. <laughs> but I was saying the ripple effect of carnivore. I don't know what you're seeing. You've been doing this for six years now, but I, I'm probably biased because I'm carnivore. and That's all I talk about now. But like I said, uh, my mom's stepdad, two sisters are doing it. And now they're an example. And now more people are doing it because of them. Do you see carnivore like it's getting really popular right now? It seems like it's spreading like wildfire, but maybe that's just because I'm biased. and I'm so close to it. Yeah, I definitely think there's a jump right now or in the last six months ish, um, maybe a little bit more than that. But I think all diets have waves. Um, I do think carnivore has this efficacy that no other diet can just because you're removing all tox. It's like the most baseline of a diet, a simple diet. And when as much as it sounds crazy, that's why I recommend uh, carnivore as an elimination diet. And it's very methodical and why I do that. Because if I can convince you to just do it for 30, 60 days, 
right? You're not saying it's forever. You're not saying you can never eat a birthday cake. But if I can convince you to just do it 30, 60 days as an elimination diet, just to see. And if you feel better, you will never forget get how good you felt. And my hope is that's will more than any crazy story, blood work, science, blah, blah, blah. If you have your own story that you are doing better, that is what will sell you to stay carnivore, eat more meat based. And so I think as more and more people do it and it's, and it's healing and beneficial for them, then they will share. Because I know that no matter how much I share the science, it's not convincing. But if, if I had lost 200 pounds and my neighbor's like, how did you do it? And I said, I know it's crazy, but I ate just meat. When that person is struggling with their obesity or whatever they're struggling with, and they remember my story they'll have a point of desperation where they'll say, I'm going to do it. I'll just try. And that trying is all I need for people to then start considering and believing in carnivore. Mm. I love everything you're saying. Cause that's, that was me too. I'm like, this is crazy. Carnivore is crazy. And the yeah. only way I convinced myself was it was Dr. Barry helped a little bit, but I, I said exactly what you just said, Judy. I'm like, I'm not telling myself I'm going to eat meat for 30 days. I'm just going to eliminate all of the junk. I could wrap my brain around that. Mm -hmm. I still can't wrap my brain around eating meat for 30 days. And I tell the same thing to people too, knowing just like you, just do this for 30 days. And then on day 31, go eat your birthday cake. Right. But you, you and I both know they're going to be feeling so amazing after 30 days. Like everyone I've told it to, my mom, my stepdad, my sister. So like, I'm going to keep going. Like, why would I turn back now? Yeah. But and then think about the ripple effect of them sharing with their friends. So my mom, not understanding a lot of the science, at 71, people will say, you look so good through the pandemic. What have you? So she's been like four years carnivore keto. And they'll, they'll say, what do you do? And they see that she only eats fatty meat. And sometimes she'll eat kimchi because she's Korean. But and <laughs> and so then she's like, I don't know, it fixed me, right? I don't I'm not and they see that she's not on any diabetic medications. She no longer has an inhaler at home. She's not wearing uh, like compression socks or uh, two size two big shoes. She's not doing any of that. And so she has a few of her friends eating more fatty meat now. So that's just the power of stories. You cannot deny it because there's no motive or there's no, what's your underlying motive of sharing this with me, right? It's just, yes. I'm just sharing my story. It worked for me. It may work for you. Yes. Yeah. Not to keep going back to it, but that's the whole idea of the carnivore diet documentary, sharing documented examples. This is what happened for me. Do what you want with it sort of thing. No, uh, I love it. I love it. I, I love that your mom's doing it too and just uh, thriving. That has been one thing I've learned over the last couple of weeks that just has blown my mind. I've been talking to so many people about the Carnivore Diet documentary and then also just from the YouTube videos I've done. And it's been crazy. I don't know if you're seeing this too, Judy, but the number of um, elderly folks in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that are thriving on carnivore. I get emails every single day. I'm 75. I've been doing carnivore for four years and I'm just, they're just thriving on it. It's, it, I'm so happy every time I hear one of those uh, stories yeah. and it's unbelievable to me because I'm like, man, if I was 75, I think I'd be kind of set in my ways and I'm like, I'm not going to start eating meat now, but have you seen it? Well, I, I know you have the experience with your mom, but have you seen that um, otherwise with, with folks, uh, that are older doing well in carnivore? Yeah, my dad's also carnivore. So he had high cholesterol. They were both very overweight. And now he's so slim and he walks like an hour or two hours every day. He's very healthy. And he's also 71, 72. And, and then even in our clientele, we have lots of people in their 70s. Um, I interviewed somebody that's 80, 81 now, I believe. And she's finally first time ever, she says she feels the healthiest in her life. And so she, she thinks maybe as you get older, it might just take a little bit slower to see the benefits, but she still felt the benefits. It wasn't a perfect carnivore initially, just so she had a little bit of hiccups, but she's thriving and she would never change the way she eats now because she's feeling so much better. And I think it's, it's aging gracefully, right? Of being able to have your bones intact and your muscles. Um, I interviewed with uh, Dr. Donald Lehman, who's an amino acid specialist, and he said, that any woman over the age of 65, when they fall, 30% of them will never walk again. And then of that, and maybe I'm getting the exact percentages wrong, but, and then of that, half of them will die within that year. 
And if you eat enough muscle, you'll preserve your muscle mass as well as your bone health. And so why wouldn't you do that as you're getting older? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. I, I, I saw an article you had a while back about uh, practicing gratitude, and I really enjoyed that. Um, the, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Jeff, that's doing the stage four cancer, he started a YouTube channel called Blessings on My Journey. And I said, why'd you call mm -hmm. it that? And he said, I look at every single thing that's happened to me since I was diagnosed with stage four cancer as a blessing. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, gratitude and the sort of because when I think about carnivore I get kind of cynical I'm like you just eat meat it's pretty easy but there's a lot of it that's sort of a mind game like what, what do you how do you feel about the the mental aspect of carnivore oh I think it's like huge I think it's huge so we're finding that some people have environmental illness like let's say Lyme for example and they're not healing enough even with carnivore plus and they're a lot better with carnivore but still not as healthy as they wish they could be and what we're finding is people with trauma, people with, um, un, I guess, emotions and scenarios that have happened in their past, past hurts that they've never truly addressed, the body keeps the score. So it's this thing where we're finding studies, and I'm probably going to talk about it in my next book, but you see the adrenal um, HPA access get affected and then how it manifests as chronic pain or chronic fibromyalgia. And you see that your mind, the way that we perceive the world will absolutely affect whether we have a good day or not, right? So at, I like to give the example of if let's, let's say I was in a, when I was young, I was in this area where there was a gunfight and somebody died. And then now every time I hear a loud like backfire from a car, I jump and it's that cortisol response. So my body kind of tenses up. I feel a little bit of um, sweat and my cortisol is absolutely released in that way where someone else may have heard the same thing and they don't even notice it. So their body's still in that rest and digest state. So if you think about cortisol, it becomes catabolic, meaning that it breaks down muscle tissue. And if you're constantly scared of the world and you're perceiving the world in such a negative place, you're bound so when your cortisol is high, your immune system um, is more activated. And so it impairs digestion. It's it, it intentionally that way. So when you eat, your all the blood rushes to your gut so you can digest. And then when you have to flee from an animal, all your blood digests to your extremity so you can run. So if you're in this chron chronic, chronic state of fear and um, the world is negative or the world is out to get me, you're going to chronically be in the state of not healing and not digesting. And so that's why I think that mindset really is so important. And so if you're in a place of gratitude, I'm thankful for what I'm eating, I'm thankful for the life I live, then that room of negativity is so hard, you cannot have gratitude and negativity at the same time. Mm. Love that. Okay. Uh, all right, one more question. So I, I um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. It's, Sure. I was talking to Dr. Chafee on the 24 hour live stream and he's kind of like, everyone should just be carnivore. And then Dr. Baker was on too. And he's like, no, nah, it's like some people should, some shouldn't. What are your thoughts? Is like carnivore for everyone or is there, I think it, I think it goes back to the personality. So in a perfect world, yes, we're all carnivore, right? But we live in real life. So if your psyche says, I need to be perfect carnivore in order to heal, in order to thrive. But let's say you end up cheating or you end up eating something other than meat every single day or every few days, then there are more times that you end up binging because you weren't quote unquote perfect enough. And if that's the case for you, maybe 95% carnivore is better for you than 100%. And that's where I think we are so wired differently. We even do personality tests on our clientele now where we're like, do you like information in bite-sized pieces? Do you like it in nuance where it's general, like eat this amount of meat versus eat 200 and grams of meat? And people are wired so differently. So I think once, when we worked with people, we realized this nuance and individualized care that I will not force somebody to eat strict carnivore if I know they can't handle it. So if they're like, I'm a perfectionist, I have to eat perfect carnivore. But then every few days, they see their church friends going and eating something else. And then that causes them to stray and then 
eat off plan and then eat off plan for weeks. I'd rather them say you can eat that whatever that thing is for that day. But let's get back on schedule the next day, right? So it's that leniency, depending on your personality, and people and the only person that will really know that is you. And Mm -hmm. that's where I think Baker has done it longer, I think, at least in the in the working with people individually, I would say so maybe that's where he has seen more leniency, because I think it's when you work with enough people that they humble you to then change your, um, your opinions. And so I was if you read my first book, I was very, very strict. And now I think I realize, okay, there's this like, blend you have to do with real life. And so strict carnivore is ideal but it's not very practical. So finding that balance, like where are you in your baseline of health and symptoms that if you do want to add something else, can you handle it mentally and physically? And that's where I think your sweet spot is. And for some people, it may be strict carnivore. Right. Yeah. It's, I've been noticing that too. Like for myself, I, um, I couldn't, I, if I had one little granule of sugar right now, I would be done. Like I can't control mm-hmm. myself. But then on the flip side, I think it helps me with carnivore because I've been doing it for six months and I'm just completely strict. So it's like, I can do like the polar opposite on either end. I've noticed that with other people too. And I've realized, yeah, some people, some people aren't that way either. So it's like, I'm not a, I'm not a moderator at all. I hate that word moderation too, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. So I, the last thing I ever tested was a sugar. So I think it was like year five. So I was willing to try broccoli, right? Because broccoli is so boring of a food. And I know, I know people will think, well, why would you even want to bring in broccoli, but just to test myself. But when it came to real sugar, I didn't test myself till a lot later. And I still don't because I know that sugar is addictive. So I would never full on like eat a scoop of ice cream or anything, but it's knowing yourself and then figuring out that balance, if that makes sense. Yeah. This has been great. I it's almost, I can't believe an hour went by already. Um, I, I'm so happy for what you're doing. It's like you you figured this out for yourself and you went through some horrible things with the depression and everything else. And then you have this passion to do it. And then it almost turns into this responsibility. And now you're helping a lot of people uh, through your work. Mm-hmm. So I, I love what you're doing. I really appreciate your time. I guess if I have one last question, we were kind of asking folks this regarding the documentary. Uh, you've been doing this for six years now. If you could kind of distill down everything you've learned, this is kind of a hard question, but everything you sort of learned about carnivore, your wisdom and everything, if you could kind of distill all that down into one message for the general public, what would it be? Find the meats you enjoy and eat the foods that you love on a carnivore diet. And then from there have grace for yourself. So if you eat a meat that was a little bit leaner than you wanted, or you ate a meat that wasn't as grass finished or perfect massaged meat that you wanted, have grace for yourself. If it had a little bit of black pepper that is higher with oxalates, have grace. It's not about perfection today because that level of perfection may make you fail in the long journey and our wellness and our diet is about our longevity. So if you can be good on most days and eat clean on most days, that is a win compared to just think of the rest of the world and how they eat on a daily basis. Like I get shocked at some of the foods that are around and what my kids friends bring to school. So occasionally, if my kids eat something that's not carnivore, I'm okay, because it's the long game that we're looking at. And the educational bits, right? So now when you try like a ice cream and you don't feel good now you know why and so i think it's think of it as a journey enjoy the meats you enjoy eat fatty meats because that'll help with so much of the energy and the hormones but beyond that don't get so caught up in all the nuances i know it gets so easy to get sucked into social media and influencers and what this person did but find your own journey because no one will know your body and its symptoms and cues better than you awesome love it Thank you so much, Judy. So can we do a couple of shout outs for you? So you have uh, nutritionwithjudy.com, your website. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? I know you have some books too and uh, YouTube and you've done some really cool videos. I, some with Laura Spath and some others. A- anything else you want to shout out? No, we just have our podcast, uh, the Nutrition with Judy podcast, as well as that YouTube channel, as you mentioned. Our book is Carnivore Cure, so you can get it at carnivorecure.com. It's also on Amazon, and we have a beginner's carnivore book coming out in January. It's the 
um, the beginner's guide to carnivore. And then <clears throat> I'm updating ver carnivore cure uh, version two for next year. That's awesome. I'm happy for beginner's guide to carnivore because it's one of the biggest questions I get. It's like, go, go read that book. That's why I tell people, I'm like, you got to do your research, do your research, right. so be, able to, be able to point them somewhere. So this has been great. Thank you so much, Judy. I really appreciate it. I will have links to all of those things we just talked about in the description below and follow Judy at nutritionwithjudy.com. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for having me.